Kia ora whanau. Give Mitch a hand, he's amazing. Just want to warmly welcome all of you guys in Jesus' name. Do we normally have a bit more of a house lights on? I sort of can't see anyone. This morning, um, Christy and I have been on a bit of a break for the last couple of weeks, but it's always amazing to get back to our church family, and um, you guys are all amazing, so we we love you all. And uh, what we've felt to do for a long time is to to start or to do a message on spiritual warfare, so um, so that's what we're going to be doing over the last, I'm not sure how many weeks it's going to take, but um, it's, it's no surprise to most of us that, and I've shared about this the last few weeks, that um, this We've entered a, a time of intense conflict, probably more than, and as it's it's proven to be more than any other conflict in history before World War II or since World War II, and um, it's it's just crazy, you know. Every every time you look at the the Herald, there's some sort of conflict happening, and it's and it's ramping up. And prophetically, um, I've heard people saying and declaring that uh, the church has to realise that we're no longer in peacetime; we're in wartime. And as as a result of that, we have actually got to do life differently. Um, as believers and as church communities. Uh, So last year, the oversight team really felt that it would be great to to tackle this subject, um, and I just do think it's it's a really good time to do it. Um, Usually, whenever anyone speaks on spiritual warfare, like things start to go weird and wrong, Um, and that's just like confirmation that we're on the right track, that the devil doesn't want us to know a little bit about the strategies that we we need to to know regarding fighting the spiritual battle. Uh, So this is a timely message. It is a huge huge topic. We could preach for ages on spiritual warfare, but what we're going to do is, is just, I think, over the next few weeks, just hit some relevant topics that we feel is really good for our church to know and to learn. We want to keep this as practical as possible, as authentic as possible, and as balanced as possible. So what usually happens when we start as believers thinking about spiritual warfare um, or the spiritual realm Usually one of two extremes. The first extreme is that we sort of downplay um, the spiritual realm. We downplay the demonic. We forget that there is an influence happening in a a realm that we cannot see on this physical realm. So we just sort of don't care about it. Uh, We disregard it. That's one extreme. But the other extreme is that we get too focused um, on, on the spiritual realm, on the demonic and people just start to get weird. It's, we have a faith, but usually when, when you're overbalanced with this, fear comes in, and you have a faith, but the foundation of that faith is fear. So we don't want to um, go to either of those extremes as we talk about this. I just am really praying that it will be as balanced as possible. But having said that, we've got to understand that we are in a spiritual battle, that there is spiritual warfare raging all around us right now as we speak. Um, and whether we realize it or not, the second we gave our lives to Jesus, we were drafted or we volunteered for his army. We are soldiers, whether you realize it or not. Today, you are a soldier in the army of God. What type of soldier we are, that's to be debated. But nevertheless, we are soldiers in this crazy battle. So uh, this morning, we're just going to talk about just a, a brief introduction of this. And then um, in, in a future weeks, we're going to sort of springboard over a few things. So firstly, number one. We have an enemy. Actually, we have three enemies as, as Christians. We have the world or this world system. We have our flesh, uh, which is our fallen nature, and we have the devil. But we just want to talk about the devil because we're talking about spiritual warfare. We have an enemy. And I just want to sort of bring out four sentences. And this is the traditional orthodox historic, historical view of the church um, throughout history as to the origins of evil and the origins of Satan, and this is what we hold to and believe here at New Church. So firstly, Satan, otherwise known as the devil, was created by God, and whether he was created as a high-ranking angel or that he rose through the ranks, we're not sure, but he was created by God. He's not an eternal being. He's created. Um, He was a high-ranking angel. He was originally called Lucifer. He led a rebellion against God along with one-third of all the angels and was cast out of heaven Lucifer became Satan and his angels became malevolent malevolent entities, fallen angels, demons. Satan's mission is to rob, kill, and destroy mankind, hell-bent on taking as many people to hell with him. He doesn't reign in hell. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. Uh, so we've got to understand that. Um, and, and honestly, that's super basic, super nutshell. Find a good study Bible or some good websites if you want to do some more study on this. But I just want to bring out two really good uh, portions of Scripture this morning. First of all, Luke chapter 10, verse 17 
to 20. And if you're new here on the Bible app, um, all the sermon notes are on there when I preach. So you can save that or look at it later. It's up live for usually about a week. So Jesus sends out the 12, then he sends out the 72 disciples to minister in his name. And this is what they said, verse 17. The 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of Of the enemy. So I think that's such an amazing verse to open this series with that in Jesus' name, in Him, we have authority. Um, And it's serpents and scorpions there is, is a metaphor of the demonic realm authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. I believe all the power that we give the enemy, all the power that the enemy had, as is the power that we give Him. And nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. So Jesus is sort of saying, don't get overbalanced with this. Don't get obsessed with what's happening in the demonic realm. Don't rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. If you've given your life to Jesus, your name is written in heaven. Isn't that awesome? Revelation 12, verse 7 and onwards. Um, Revelation is a tricky book because it's apocalyptic literature, which means it's sort of got the, the language of the, the prophets, and it's, it's a little bit sort of doom and gloom. But what we've got to remember a little bit to understand Revelation is it's not linear. It's not really chronological. Sometimes they're using prophetic, apocalyptic wording and phrasing, but they are mentioning or referring to something that's happened in the past. And the, the traditional protestant view of revelation 12 verse 7 onwards is that this even though it's in the book of revelation it's talking about the origins of the fall of satan so verse 7 now war arose in heaven michael and his angels fighting against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back but he was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven and the great dragon was thrown down that ancient serpent who was called the devil and satan the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and his angels were thrown down with him. It's pretty clear. Go down to verse 17. Um, And this is traditionally called the woman of the apocalypse. And again, traditional church history, um, the the, the Protestant viewpoint is that the woman here is, is talking about the church worldwide, like the bride of Christ. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. We are at war. Number one, we have an enemy. Number two, we are at war. We are in a spiritual war. Um, and in John six thirty three, there's another one in your notes, and you can read that at your own leisure, but Jesus gathers his his closest friends, his disciples, and this is just before um, he goes to the cross, and he's just wanting to give them sort of like a, a farewell speech, and this is what he says at the end of that, in this world, you will have tribulation. So tribulation means intense problems, like a whole load of issues. How's that for encouragement this morning? This is what's going to happen if we're a believer in Jesus. No one's saying amen right now because it's not that encouraging. It gets more encouraging. Um, you, you never see a bumper sticker or like a, a, a fridge magnet with this, like this verse on it. In this world, you will have tribulation. This is what Jesus says. So it's like, it's not, shouldn't be a surprise when we experience spiritual warfare when we make a stand for Jesus. In this world, you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Isn't that encouraging? Francis Schaeffer says this, and I love this quote. You have established a new relationship with the powers of darkness. Whatever you were before you were a Christian, you are now a sworn foe of the legions of hell. Have no delusions about their reality or their hostility, but do not fear them. The God inside you terrifies them. They cannot kill you, let alone hurt you, but they can still seduce and they will try. They will also oppose you as you obey Christ. 
If you are serious about Christ being your Lord and God, you can expect opposition. If you are serious about Christ being your Lord and God, you can expect opposition. If, if, we, are, if we are followers of Jesus and, and we experience no spiritual warfare in our life, that it's just like tiptoeing through the tulips in our life, then I would suggest something is a little bit off with our relationship with God. Because it means that we are no longer a, a, a target. We are not a threat to the enemy of God if, if we'd never experienced spiritual warfare in our life. If you are serious about Christ being your Lord and God, you can expect opposition. Who's encouraged? <laughs> we have an enemy. The battle is... Number two, we are at war. Number three, the battle is spiritual. It's not a physical war. It's not like the Ukraine and Russia right now. It's a spiritual battle. Ephesians 6 verse 10 to 12. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. I might make a message just about that verse there. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So we are in the spiritual battle. I think there are three points that like, I must understand. Like, we've got to get these next three points as believers if we want to have a good, strong, solid view on spiritual warfare. Number one, everything we see in the visible spiritual realm is uh, provoked or at least influenced by something in the invisible spiritual realm. Everything we see in the visible physical realm is provoked or at least influenced by something in the invisible spiritual realm. It's so easy to sort of forget that there is a spiritual realm that is as real, if not more real, than this physical realm that we're a part of now. There is a spiritual realm, and it is so real. The only thing is that we don't see it, and because we can't see it tangibly, we tend to think that it doesn't exist, but it is absolutely real. And um, I love 2 Kings 6 verse 17. Elisha and his servant, uh, it looks like um, there's going to be huge defeat with the people of God, and they're outside of the city, and this is what Elisha does. Then Elisha prayed and said, O oh Lord, please open his eyes, open his servant's eyes, that he may see. So his servant could see, but this is talking about seeing into the spiritual realm. The, then Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, please open his eyes, that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. They were always there, fighting on, on, on behalf, like the, the God's uh, angels, and, and, and fighting the spiritual realm. It was absolutely happening there. They just couldn't, he just couldn't see it, and therefore didn't realize that the victory was already theirs. So we've got to understand, even some people are graced at times to see into the spiritual realm. There are spiritual forces at work right now in, in this community, in, in our families, in, in our life. And just because we can't see them doesn't mean they are no less real. They are so real, and we've got to remember that. So that's first must understand. Secondly, the enemy is the devil and his forces, not people. It is so easy when, when a person hurts you or does something uh, to, to hack you off or, or the offenses come and, and you struggle with unforgiveness. It's so easy to make a person the enemy. And, and that's not what the Bible teaches at all. Our, our, our foes are the devil and his armies, never people. Now, people can be wicked and people can be evil and, and, and people that are like that need to take responsibility for their actions, but people are manipulated and influenced. We, we're all conduits to... To either the Holy Spirit or the demonic realm when you think about it. Uh, but we've got to understand that people are not the enemy. You know, if you're experiencing great hurt, like pray for forgiveness uh, of that person. It doesn't mean to, to, to release them of, of all the consequences. You give the consequences of their life into the hands of God, no longer yourself. 
uh, and, and you pray and you bless them, but you've got to understand a spiritual war is happening over their soul and the devil is the enemy, not the person. Number three, God and the devil are not equal opposites. And I it's sort of called dualism and you know the, the yin and yang sign, it's like equal parts light and dark and a lot of people believe that it's got to be sort of an, an equal uh, balance to this universe of, of light and dark and good and evil. And, and therefore, a lot of people bring that thinking into believing in God. It's like, well, God is, is, is here and he's good and Satan is over here and they both balance each other and it's like 50-50 chance and um, you know, we're not sure if, if God's going to win or not. That is absolutely not what the Bible teaches at all. God and the devil are not equal opposites. God is eternal. He always has been. He's all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere present. Satan, on the other hand, is a created being, not all-powerful, not all-knowing, not everywhere present. It's like, by comparison, Satan is a little ant on the toe of God. I was thinking, that doesn't even sort of, like, Satan is a little amoeba on the ant that's on the, like, there's no comparison at all. And we got to remember that. We're on the right side if we're followers of Jesus. Smith Wigglesworth, one of my heroes, um, and you can read about how incredible that guy was. He was a plumber and um, just got radically changed by God and supernatural signs and wonders ministry. This is, this is a proven story about his life. On one occasion, Wigglesworth awoke during the night aware of a satanic presence. Looking across the room, he saw the devil himself standing there. Like, not just a demon, but the devil himself. Wigglesworth said to Satan, oh, it's only you. Then he turned over and went back to sleep. <laughs> I think with, with media and people making movies that don't understand this at all, they make evil out to be so powerful and all-consuming. It's like, oh, if we, you know, if, if it would be a fluke if, if, if good wins in the end. It's not like that at all. We are soldiers, number four. So what are we learning this morning? It's a bit of a teachy sermon. We have an enemy. The battle is spiritual. We are soldiers. 2 Timothy 2, 1 to 4. You then, my child. This is Paul talking to, to a young pastor, Timothy. Be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have learned from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. We are soldiers. And throughout the Bible, the church, which we are a part of, uh, worldwide is, is called the Bride of Christ. It's a living organism. We're living stones, but it also is called an army. We are an army of believers. We are soldiers in this army of God. Uh, I, I grew up in the Salvation Army, and my uh, favorite Salvation Army song of all time was Onward Christian Soldiers, written in the 1800s. And interestingly enough, it's been removed from some hymnals um, in different denominations because it's too military-like. Uh, it's like So we, we can't think about being soldiers of God because that's too military-like. Uh, and I don't know what they're thinking, why they did that. But I just want to read, and like back in those days... I don't know, they, they do about 57 verses to each song. <laughs> Slight exaggeration, but I just want to read the whole thing because it is so encouraging. And when you go through church history, like in the last 100, 200 years, like the church got this. The church knew that they were in a spiritual war, that they were soldiers in the army of God. To be honest, I think we've lost something in, in the Western church. We've got to get that, that passion and that fight and, and that that good, godly, military spirit back into our lives again. Onward, Christian soldiers marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus going on before, Christ, the royal master, leads against the foe. Forward into battle, see his banners go. At the sign of triumph, Satan's hoth, Satan's hoth doth flee. On then, Christian soldiers, on to victory. Hell's foundations quiver at the shout of praise. Brothers, lift your voices, loud your anthems raise. Like a mighty army moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where the saints have trod. We are not divided, all one body we. One in hope and doctrine, one in charity. 
What the saints established, that I hold for true. What the saints believed, I believe that too. Long as earth endureth, men the faith will hold. Kingdoms, nations, empires in destruction rule. Crowns and thrones may perish, kingdoms rise and wane, but the church of Jesus constant will remain. Gates of hell can never against that church prevail. We have Christ's own promise, and that cannot fail. Last verse. Onward then, you people, join our happy throng. Blend with ours your voices in the triumph song. Glory, Lord, and honor unto Christ the King. Through this, count, this through countless ages, men and angels sing. Isn't that exciting? Is there something like a bit of a shout or a roar in your heart rising this morning? Because we need it. This church needs it. This community needs it. Remember back, way back, like 1999, like that's like a quarter of a century ago, there was, uh, it was a newsletter that, that was circulated in New Zealand called Missions Outreach Newsletter. And this was a, an excerpt on that that I've never forgotten. It's always been in my notes. So we're talking a quarter of a century ago. Today, the church in China numbers probably in excess of 120 million believers, a far cry from the few thousand known followers of Jesus at the eve of the communist era. Why? The answer is total commitment. Chinese believers know they are in danger of death for being Christians, but they don't care. They know what God has saved them from and that Jesus died for them. The least they can do is to be willing to give their lives for their Savior. In a particular network of large house churches, the requirements of anyone wishing to be a co-worker are these. So uh, a a group of house churches, if you want to be involved in ministry, this is the, the requirements. Always be ready to run from the police and return to the harvest fields to labor. Always be ready to pray a minimum of four hours a day. Always be ready to preach the gospel. Always be ready to suffer for Jesus. Always be ready to die for Jesus. Tell you what, if we had that attitude, if I had that attitude, we would set the world on fire. And they have. I mean, China is incredible for the gospel today. So getting back to that opening statement I said about we are all soldiers What sort of soldiers are we? Are we truly an army or are we an audience as believers? Are we truly an army with the attitude of being soldiers in this army or are we an audience? I know I've got a few quotes here this morning, but that's that's the way it is today. Um, Jim Elliott, he was martyred on the mission field in 1956. He was one of five guys that well, we're going into unreached people groups in South America, and there was a misunderstanding with the tribe they were reaching for Jesus. They end up getting killed um, on the mission field. But before he died, I'm not sure how, fur- uh, how long before, but this is what his heart and attitude was. We are so utterly ordinary, so commonplace, while we profess to know a power the 20th century does not reckon with. But we are harmless. We are spiritual pacifists, non-militants, conscientious objections, objectors, in this battle to the death with principalities and powers in high places. Meekness must be had for contact with men, but outspoken boldness is required to take part in the comradeship of the cross. We are sideliners, coaching and criticizing the real wrestlers, while content to sit by and leave the enemies of God unchallenged. The world cannot hate us. We are too much like its own. Oh, that God would make us dangerous. We have an enemy. The battle is spiritual. We are soldiers. We have already won. Last point this morning. We have already won. It's like, well, how can you say that, Simon? Because... Like, there's still spiritual warfare all around us. Like, we know what's going to happen at the end. We are on the winning team. We don't fight just to gain victory because the victory has already been won. We, we fight out of an attitude or a position of victory already. How does that work? We've already got the victory, but there's still a fight going on. Um, for those that know me, I love, I love sort of, especially World War II history. So... When D-Day happened, June the 6th, 1944, as soon as the Allied forces to which New Zealand was 
apart, landed on the beaches of Normandy, France. That very second that they landed and established a beachhead, the war had been won. There was no way that Germany and the Axis forces could win at that point in time. The victory was sure. There was no way uh, that, that Germany was going to win, the Nazis were going to win. That day, the battle was decided, but there was hard fighting for another year, I think, because the enemy dug, dug in and, and they fought hard because they knew that their time was short. They knew that the battle had lost, but they were wanting to fight as much as they can because their time was short. And it's, exactly, it's a very good analogy for us um, and the kingdom of heaven when we're talking about spiritual forces and the spiritual warfare. The battle has been already won on the cross thousands of years ago. When Jesus died on that cross and, and took on himself the penalty and the pain and the price for all of our sin, and he's not there anymore, he rose again. He broke the curse of sin and death. And before that, he shouted those amazing words, it is finished. That day, the, the decision for the spiritual warfare, well, it was won, no doubt about it. But now the enemy knows his time is short. And he's doing all he can to continue to rob and kill and destroy from mankind and to take as many people to hell with him. We have already won the victory. Well, Jesus has already won the victory for us. We are on the winning team. So instead of being fearful and freaking out, we can now fight from a position of victory already. And once you get that in your heart and more importantly in your spirit, it will change the way you live. It will change your prayers. And you'll become a force to be reckoned with. We've already won. Captain Reginald Wallace says, The triumphant Christian does not fight for victory. He celebrates a victory already won. Colossians 2, verse 13 to 15. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. And, and if you're here today, if you're watching this and you've never given your life to Jesus, there's this thing called sin and with it brings, comes shame and regret and pain and all of that. Jesus died on the cross and rose again so that your sins can be washed away. The only one substance in all of eternity and all of this universe that can wash sins away, and it's only the blood of Jesus. And he's done that already for us. People say salvation's a free gift. It's offered to us for free, but Jesus had to pay for it with his life. So if you're here today, you've never given your life to Jesus, and your, your life can completely change this morning. You can, you can be set free. Um, you can be healed you can have a new hope, a new destiny in your life. So please don't leave this morning without thinking about that, without talking about that with someone. So you were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all of our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities, he shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. He shamed the principalities and powers publicly by triumphing over them on the cross. Now, we sort of lose a little bit of the meaning in, in our day and age, but back then it was a regular occurrence, especially with the Roman army when they came in and, and they, they overtook um, a region, or, or it happened with a lot of rulers actually, they, they rounded up the king and, and whoever was in leadership and usually they stripped them, they beat them and then they tied them up and, and bound them with chains and then they paraded them through the city um, behind their chariot or the chariots to parade that they had won the victory and these people were, had been completely decimated, completely defeated, completely humiliated. Now when the, the the, the people in the first century read those words or heard those words in Colossians. They would have had that um, imagery in their mind. They knew what this meant. In this way, Jesus disarmed the spiritual rulers. He disarmed them. He's taken away the weapons of the enemy and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Now, we can sort of read that and think, oh, yeah, okay, it's, it's encouraging. We can really get that. Like, disarmed Satan and his forces. Like, what does that actually mean? Like, I, I, I've got a love-hate relationship with sharks. I love great white sharks. Well, on my bucket list, I want a shark cage dive with a massive great white. Uh, years ago, I was surfing with Les and out the back on my longboard, and this, this huge shark just cruised past. Um, don't want to have that experience again. I want to be in a cage when that happens. 
But if a great white shark had no teeth, would I still be scared of great white sharks? It would just be like a whale shark. And although they are sort of a bit big, uh, obviously it would be like, whoa, a bit daunting swimming with them. People love swimming with them because they know they have no teeth and they know they're harmless. Would we be scared of a great white shark if it didn't have any teeth? Would it be called jaws? It would be called gums. <laughs> yeah, I went and saw gums. It's like it, was a, it wasn't very scary. Like that shark tried to gum someone's leg and it just like tickled. It's, it's exactly the same that's happened to the forces of darkness. They have been disarmed. They have been de-jawed. They have been de-toothed. And once we understand that, yeah, we're still in a battle. Yeah, we're still going to probably take some hits. We're going to understand tribulation. But we are no longer, we never have been, or we were, but now because we've given our lives to Jesus, we are not on the losing side. We have the victory because of what Jesus has done already, and we can live out of that place of victory. So when we're going through some stuff, we don't have to put up with it. We can go to the throne room of grace and say, hey, Jesus, I want to thank you for what you did on the cross. Thank you that you disarmed the principalities and powers. You've disarmed them. You've taken out their teeth. And I'm praying in a place of victory. And when the, the enemy understands you, understand your authority, then things can change. You get the breakthrough. So in conclusion... I grew up in the Salvation Army, as you knew, and uh, as you know, and as a um, young kid, everyone has their struggles, and there was one, and I can't even remember his name, he was like a salty dog in the Salvation Army at this youth camp, and um, went and rededicated my life to, to God one, one camp, and uh, a few weeks later, he sent me a letter with what I'm going to read you soon, and I've never forgotten it, um, and it's sort of, I've, I've always sort of thought that's, that's such an amazing thing. So this is all over the internet. Actually, no one knows, I think, where the original um, writing came from, but it's super encouraging. And um, I'm going to read it, and then at the end, I'm just going to ask us as a response to stand and to, and as a, as a faith statement to God saying, God, I know I'm a soldier in this army. I was, graft, I was drafted in when I gave my life to you, but I want to be a good soldier in your army. And I want to pray for those that, that want to make that commitment this morning. So with that in mind, I'm just going to read this and let the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts as I do. I am a soldier in the army of my God. The Lord Jesus Christ is my commanding officer. The Holy Scripture is my code of conduct. Faith, prayer, and the Word are my weapons of warfare. I have been taught by the Holy Spirit, trained by experience, tried by adversity, and tested by fire. I'm a volunteer in this army, and I'm enlisted for eternity. I will not get out, sell out, be talked out, or pushed out. I am faithful, reliable, capable, and dependable. If my God needs me, I am there. I am a soldier. I am not a baby. I do not need to be pampered, pipped, pitted, primed up, pumped up, picked up, or pepped up. I am a soldier. No one has to call me, remind me, write me, visit me, entice me, or lure me. I am a soldier. I am not a wimp. I am in place, saluting my king, obeying his orders, praising his name, and building his kingdom. No one has to send me flowers, gifts, food, cards, or candy, or give me handouts. I do not need to be cuddled, cradled, cared for, or catered to. I am committed. I cannot have my feelings hurt bad enough to turn me around. I cannot be discouraged enough to turn me aside. I cannot lose enough to cause me to quit. When Jesus called me into this army, I had nothing. If I end up with nothing, I will still come out ahead. I will win. My God has and will continue to supply all of my needs. I am more than a conqueror. I will always triumph. I can do all things through Christ. The devil cannot defeat me. People cannot disillusion me. Weather cannot weary me. Sickness cannot stop me. Battles cannot beat me. Money cannot buy me. Governments cannot silence me. And hell cannot handle me. I am a soldier. Even death cannot destroy me. For when my commander calls me from his battlefield, he will promote me to captain and then allow me to rule with him. I am a soldier in the army and I'm marching, claiming victory. I will not give up. I will not turn around. I am a soldier marching heaven bound. Here I stand. 
Will you stand with me? Now, we could have some nice keyboard and music, and that's, that's fitting for, for times, but if you're here and you just want to say, God, I want to be a soldier in your army, just stand with me, please. It's, we're living in exciting times, challenging times, but so exciting. And, uh, you know, we've been praying for, for decades of... Um, Oh, there is music. What's that music on for? Let's turn that music off. We don't need music. We're in an army. We're in a battle. It's like... What's... And some of you can remember what happened with the Jesus movement. And, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people got saved. Um, and God did something radically. And that came on, on the back of a whole lot of people getting stuffed up with drugs and sex and and they were just lonely and lost and hurting and broken. And God did something exciting. I am daring to believe we are just, that's just around the corner for us again. But we've got to be prepared. We have got to be ready. Now is the time. This world conflict is ramping up. And we need to have a different attitude as Christians and as believers. We need to understand we're in this battle. The battle has already been won. But God is calling upon us to stand up and take our place in his army. And to, and to be victorious and to understand the enemy, and to not be unbalanced, and to not be fearful, but to, to be strong and victorious, and, and take our place in what God is calling us to. And I don't know, there's probably all of us standing, that's pretty awesome. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you that you've done it all. Lord, that you've disarmed the principalities and powers. Lord, I want to thank you that the battle has already been won. Lord, we know what the end of the story is. We, we know that the victory is sure and is certain, but we understand we have a foe. And, and the devil, in and, and Revelation, it says he's going to fight hard because he knows his time is short. But Lord, we want to say, and put a stand and raise our hand and say, God, I want to be a good soldier. I want to be a powerful soldier. Lord, I want to do what you've called me to do in, in this time and in this season. Lord, I pray that the church, especially in the West, we will wake up and we will stand up and we will do what you've called us to do. And we will be ready. I know that. I think it was Richard Wurmbrand that said the greatest uh, tragedy in the Western church is that in peacetime it does not prepare for wartime. Well, we want to prepare now. We want to have our hearts right. We want to have our hearts on fire for you. Because we know that we want to do something incredible in this nation and in the West. Lord, we are soldiers. Lord, we dedicate our life to you afresh. We surrender our life to you afresh. We give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Give the Lord a hand. You can be seated again. Sorry when I told you guys to turn the music off. I didn't, didn't mean to be mean. Oh, really? Um, so we're just about to finish, but before we do, just want to honor a couple of people this morning. So um, if Hannah and Dan could quickly jump up on stage, it would be great. I'm gross.